Uh, my name is Jennifer Marvin. I'm the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Statewide Coordinator for Florida Friendly Landscaping. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Homeowner, Homeowners Webinar Series. Uh, this is the second presentation in our series. Uh, on April 20th at 11 a.m., we'll have uh, a presentation on horticultural therapy. Um, if, today we're talking about turf grass for homeowners with Dr. Brian Unruh. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please place them in the chat box and we will uh, get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Unruh. Uh, J. Brian Unruh is a professor of environmental horticulture at the University of Florida, IFAS, West Florida Research and Education Center in J. Florida. His turf grass science program focuses on water quality and quantity, pest management and cultivar development. Brian is recognized nationally as an authority on turf industry best man management practices. Uh, and Dr. Unruh is the immediate past chair of the Crop Science Society of America's C5 division. Um, so we've got a great presentation. Um, let's get started. Please take Take it away, Dr. Andrew. All right. Well, let's. Uh, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there, as that old song goes. Um, and so, I appreciate the opportunity to to jump in and share a little bit about turf grass uh, for for homeowners. And and you know, normally Lori Trenholm would have probably done this type of presentation. Lori was our urban turf specialist, and and uh, and she retired last year. And and uh, and so. But I'm the old guy at the University of Florida. I've been here since January of 1996. And so I've had an opportunity to see a lot of, of changes happen over the last 25 years. And so, um, well, let's jump into this and, and talk about it. And so when we think about the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods, um, you, know, you know, there's some people that think that turf is not Florida friendly. Um, but really it, it does, you know, we look at principle number one and it, you know, is the right plant in the right place. And and, and turf grass is a plant um, and it can be used in the right place. And as we'll look a little while later, it can be used in the wrong place as well. But, um, you know, and ripped right from the from the book, you know, the lowdown on grass, you know, and healthy lawns clean and cool the air by absorbing carbon dioxide, releasing oxygen, collecting dust and dirt, and on and on and on. And so um, it clearly is Florida friendly. Um, there is not one grass that is more Florida friendly than the others. All of those of the lawn grasses that we have are, are referenced there in the, uh, in the handbook as well. So we uh, look along, you know, turf gets a black eye um, often, you know, people say, well, that turf grass uses too much water. The reality is, is I, and I've been doing this really since I was seven years old, and I have never, ever seen a, a stolen of St. Augustine grass gr that, that grows across the driveway, into the garage, up the wall, and turns the sprinkler system on. I've just never seen it. Um, and, and the reality is, is that people use in a, a lot of water. Um, plants are an amazing, uh, they're just amazing at, at being able to conserve water, but we see situations like this, you know, this is not a turf grass problem. This is a people problem. Um, turf grasses use way too much nitrogen, um, you know, and, and you have to fertilize it so much. And the reality is, is, um, you know, that plant will absorb a lot of, of fertilizer that's put on it. And, and by and large, most people use way too much fertilizer, just, just being straight up honest, or at least they use way too much in certain places. You know, this strip too much, this strip not enough, this strip too much, this strip not enough. Um, but this is a people problem. This is not a plant problem. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of perceptions about turf and, and we'll even, and, and you'll hear people say, you know, well, turf should be used where functionally needed. And then they have a fairly narrow definition of what function is, you know, and it's areas for recreation, you know, so you got little ones, you know, want to play in the backyard or whatever, and, uh, or for areas for pets to do their do. Um, you know, pets don't like, especially little dogs, don't like to walk out across the Asiatic jasmine and, you know, to, to relieve themselves, uh, it scratches their belly. Um, but uh, but landscapes, including turf, provide enormous ecosystem services, and that's kind of a big phrase right now, ecosystem services. And um, so we look at that and there actually is a book written on this, you know, water quality and quantity issues for turf grasses in the urban landscapes. And there's functional recreational and quality of life 
benefits of, of urban landscapes and, and urban landscapes that contain turf. And so we think about erosion control and dust prevention, soil restoration, carbon sequestration. That's a big deal right now. Um, and turf systems have an amazing ability to sequester carbon, um, air pollution control, um, oxygen production. You know, over on the recreational side of things, you know, um, you know, playing, uh, you know, think about sports, uh, recreational activities, and then quality of life. You know, some people, um, not me, I've been mowing way too long, but some people really enjoy getting out there and, and, and mowing their grass and tending to their landscape. And so these are all benefits of, of a turf grass system. Um, and so does that mean turf grass needs to dominate the landscape? Absolutely not. Um, again, you know, how, how do we utilize turf um, kind of as an anchor in, in modern landscape design. And there's a lot of people that are looking at that and discussing that. And you'll probably hear from them on some of these webinars later. But well, one of the things that most people don't understand is that there is a tremendous amount of research that goes behind, um, you know, developing new cultivars or developing management practices. Um, and this is my facility. Um, I'm located north of Pensacola in the middle of nowhere. Um, and you can see all of these little green squares um, all through this and these are all turf grass research plots. Again, when I came here in January 1996, this entire area was a cornfield. This building did not exist. And so since January 96, I built one of the largest turf research facilities in the Southeast United States, um, located uh, in the middle of nowhere between Shamukla and Allentown, Florida. Um, and so, well, let's talk about the turf grasses. Let's, you know, and I'm gonna just kind of take us on a, on a 50,000 foot flyby, uh, at least for the first half of our time together this morning. And, uh, and then we'll drive, they'll, you know, kind of drive down a little bit and, and get into some, some weeds, so to speak. And so, well, you know, selecting the right grass, you know, we, we kind of have, you know, well, what type of lawn is desired or expected? You know, is it a better homes and gardens showcase? Um, is it just an average lawn or, you know, is it a parking area on weekends, you know, when the gators are playing? Um, and, and sometimes it's all of the above. Um, Sometimes, you know, people start out wanting this and then, you know, life happens, kids happen, age happens, whatever. And, and uh, that, that showcase becomes more of an average lawn. And then before you know it, it, it has deteriorated over time. Um, so selecting the right grass is important. And so let's just do kind of a, a quick look at the grasses that we do grow in Florida. Um, they are very different than the grasses that would be grown um, north of here. These are warm season grasses. And so they grow in the warm season. Um, and Bahia grass generally produces kind of this open canopy that you see and you look down on top of it, you see a little bit of soil and you see a little bit of plants. Um, when you have open soils like this, it's also can be prone to weed invasion. Um, but Bahia grass, because of this big old gnarly um, uh, stem structure here, makes it really, really drought tolerant. Um, and so we see a lot of Bahia grass going into the urban landscapes now, especially in central Florida where you know, there's some se uh, severe water um, limitations as well. Well, we've been doing a lot of work on the, on the development side of things. You know, Bahia grass, one of the negative are all these seed heads that, that are formed. Um, you know, you mow the grass, you go in for a couple of lemonade, you come back out and those seed heads are back. Um, but you can see in this plot here, kind of in the middle where we actually have, have uh, improved Bahia grass through breeding programs, um, that we have much, um, we have lines now that, that they kind of resemble tall fescue if you're from up north, but um, they don't produce the seed heads um, like that. So stay tuned. These are, are, are forthcoming. Um, and so again, we've been working on these for a long time um, as well. Well, let's talk about Bermuda grass. And that's probably one of the biggest questions I get is, you know, well, why don't we have more Bermuda grass in the landscape in Florida? Um, and the reason for that is shade tolerance or the lack of, you know, we have a lot of trees in Florida and, um, and Bermuda grass is the least shade tolerant. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but, but within the, sh in the Bermuda grasses, there are a couple varieties that are a little more shade tolerant. And, and again, and I'll point this out a little bit later, you know, what that degree of, of relative shade tolerance is, but, but Celebration Bermuda is one of those. And you can see here in the shaded environment, and this isn't shade coming from trees. This is shade coming from large structures. Here's another one called Tiff Grand Bermuda grass. Um, you know, and, and you can see obviously the shade that is being cast upon this, this, this turf here. But so these are two that are a little more shade tolerant. Um, 
And then um, one of the interesting things and in a lot of work that's been done in recent years is really looking at drought tolerance. And so here's a, a line that has uh, been developed at the University of Georgia. We tested it under the designation DT1, which stood for drought tolerant number one. And you can see in this uh, in these plots, comparing it kind of to some of these standards, DT1 maintained uh, uh, good growth uh, and good quality in a, a drought tolerant scenario. Interestingly, in a nematode infested site at our, our facility there south of Gainesville, TIF Tough, which is that DT1, performed very well even in nematode infested site. And it's just dealing with the physiology of the plant. And so uh, drought tolerance, nematode uh, uh, tolerance as well. So. And so we've looked at Bahia grass, let's look at, uh, and we've looked at some Bermuda grass, and then centipede grass is really our predominant grass in North Florida, it makes a beautiful lawn, um, and uh, we can see this, we call this the poor man's grass because it, it doesn't like a lot of inputs. Um, and so, but there are some negatives, there's this little critter called a ground pearl um, that uh, attacks and lives on the root system, gets its name because it lives in the ground and it looks like a pearl. And, uh, but there are no control options available for this scale insect that will infect the roots. And it, interestingly, when I came to Florida 25 years ago, you saw this occasionally. Um, and it was interesting, you would just kind of see these serpentine patterns through old established centipede grass lawns. Um, interestingly, it's becoming much more problematic. And we really don't know why there's that shift. Again, there are no chemical control options. And so typically when somebody has a large scale infestation of ground pearls, the best option really is to switch grasses. Um, there's also this uh, uh, uniquely little insect called the two line spittle bug, you know, entomologist are original folks. And so it's got two lines. So let's call it a two line spittle bug. Gets its name because the juvenile lives in this little spittle mass. Looks like you spit on the ground. And if you dig through that with your pocket knife, you'll find this little, protective environment that's moist and you'll see a juvenile spittle bug. Spittle bug and a lot like a mosquito, uh, when it injects, it's got a piercing mouth part. When it, in, when it pierces the leaf blade, it injects a toxin and then that leaf blade is dead, it will die. Um, and the balance is historically, you know, I'd never have recommended treating for these things, but for various reasons over the last number of years, the two line spittle bug has become an uh, increasing problem. And again, if you're growing grass faster than the spittle bugs are killing the leaves, then, then there's really no need to treat. It will recover. This insect really likes kind of hot, moist environments. Um, and so like along sh in shaded areas, along fences um, uh, tends to be a problem. So hot, moist. Um, and uh, then we come to, to St. Augustine grass and that's the predominant lawn grass in the state of Florida. Probably about 70% of our, of our landscapes are St. Augustine grass. Beautiful lawn grass um, makes a beautiful uh, um, you know, landscape. And so, but it's interesting, you know, we go back in time over my years here and St. Augustine grass has been called the devil grass. Um, thirsty grass has evil roots. Uh, St. Augustine grass is a real water user. Well, what's really interesting is if you go out to Texas where they have real droughts, um, the one grass that survived 158 day natural drought in the state of Texas was Floratam St. Augustine grass. Um, and so it persisted through the drought. And so St. Augustine grass really isn't a real water user. People are real water users and abusers. Interestingly, Herald Tribune had an article, you know, the enemy of an adequate water supply is St. Augustine grass. Um, and then, you know, they said Bahia and Empire Zoysia, so marketing folks had got their foot in the door here. Empire Zoysia are much more drought tolerant than the St. Augustine grass. And that's really nonsense, just to be candid. Um, and so um, pathologists are, are, are uh, uh, simple folks as well. And so, you know, we've got gray spots on the leaves, so let's call it gray leaf spot. So this is a, a disease that will uh, impact St. Augustine grass, but it's not one that is generally needing control. Unless maybe you have Raleigh St. Augustine grass, which is an older variety we see more up in North Florida, um, at certain times a year, um, you will see gray leaf spot that can cause um, significant problems. But generally, this is just more of an aesthetic problem that kind of comes and goes throughout the season. Now, large patch, on the other hand, and you may have referred to this brown as brown patch. Now, brown, that would be a misnomer. Um, 
The large patch is the Rhizoctonia solani that affects warm season grasses. So we're all familiar with pandemic and we have COVID-19 and now there's these variants of COVID out there that are, um, you know, that we're hearing about. And so large patch and brown patch, they're both Rhizoctonia solani. But the difference is, is the the form or the well, the big word is the anastomosis group is different. It's a different strain of Rhizoctonia solani. And so AG, anastomosis group that infects the warm season grasses, we call large patch. And then Rhizoctonia solani that infects the cool season grasses, say up north, we call that brown patch. And so there's still some of that old nomenclature that gets kind of left laying around, but it's a large patch that is in St. Augustine and it, it, it can be quite problematic. And we know from research that it is problematic when our soil temperatures are between 65 and 75 degrees, both in the spring of the year and in the fall of the year. So as that growth, as the temperatures uh, are warming in the spring and cooling in the fall, we know that that disease, the rhizoctonia, becomes active in the soil in these two temperature regimes. Um, and so that's when we need to be most mindful of when rhizoctonia outbreaks might occur. This would be the period for treatment, again, at the onset of that temperature warming up um, and at the onset of that temperature cooling down. And those would be the points of control for large patch. Take all root rot in St. Augustine grass is this organism is caused by Gamanomyces. It is a, a fungal organism that is ubiquitous in the soil. It means it's everywhere. I could take you to a perfectly healthy lawn. We could take a sample, send it to the lab, and it would come back and it would probably have, they would have probably identified Gamanomyces growing in that, uh, in that sample, even though that lawn was perfect then I could take you out to this lawn that is imperfect, take a sample, send it to the lab, and it would come back with anastomosis group, or excuse me, with gamanomyces. Um, and so it's ubiquitous in the soil. It's typically some other stressor that comes along and causes this disease to, to increase in activity. And because it is soil borne, it tends to recur year after year. And so I had monitored this particular site. Every spring, this type of problem would occur. And so, and they would resod it. And at some point, you know, that just, they should just expand this plant bed or do something different because it's going to continue to be a problem year in and year out. Well, now there's a new one that's given us some grief in Florida, and this is the lethal viral necrosis. And in fact, just last week, a team of scientists and industry folks did a, um, a webinar, a several hour webinar on this lethal viral necrosis. If you scan this QR code here, it'll take you to the uh, YouTube video and you can watch everything you wanna know about lethal viral necrosis that is impacting St. Augustine grass. And so it is a viral complex. And so you can see kind of this mosaicing that is occurring in the leaves um, of Floratam St. Augustine grass. And in time, what happens is this disease, this, this virus tends to start killing the, uh, the, the foliage of the plant um, and then ultimately thinning out the turf significantly. Um, and I said it was, it was particular to Floratam St. Augustine. And this is an interesting location here where they came back and they sodded with a grass that was not Floratam. And you can see where it is killing the Floratam and not the other grass. Um, and so in that webinar that we did last week, we'll get into all the nuts and bolts. This is isolated right now, pretty much kind of in the Palm Beaches and then over across a little bit in, um, in the Hillsborough County. And so it's not widespread, but it is definitely taking out landscapes in those areas where it is. And there was a whole session there as well in that recording where we talk about um, means to, to remediate if you're in this site. And, and the bottom line is, is you, if you have a Floratam lawn that is being uh, taken out by the lethal viral necrosis, you have to replace it um, with a non-Floratam um, variety and really Palmetto uh, St. Augustine right now um, is the one, potentially a new one called Citra Blue um, that is being tested as well. So 
Chinch bugs, that's the number one killer, insect killer for, for the uh, St. Augustine grass. Um, just like that spittle bug, it is a piercing, sucking insect. So it pierces its little stylet in there, um, sucks the juice out, and, um, and off she goes. And so these are juveniles and these are the adults. Um, and so chinch bugs love hot, dry conditions. So we typically see these along streets, up along your driveway, um, sidewalks, anywhere that... Uh, um, that, that turf gets dry. They're really good at detecting areas where you have poor sprinkler coverage um, as well. Now, Floritam was originally released as a chinch bug resistant cultivar. And you can see from these research plots, this is chinch bug damage. And you can see Floritam shining brightly in here because it is um, uh, resistant to the insect. Now, what's interesting in Florida, our insects have evolved beyond this resistance. The grass is still the same grass. The insects have changed. So the insects in Florida will take out Floritam. Um, uh, it, 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 well, and so tropical sod webworm is another one that, that comes along in uh, another little worm insect. And you can see here, um, kind of a clear worm until it starts munching on the green foliage and then that that worm will will become green colored because you can see the the, the grass moving through the, the digestive tract of that of that insect but again they, they cause some notching um, of the leaves as well there are a couple new cultivars that are in the marketplace and you're probably hearing a lot about and one is pro vista this is a new release from the scops company and it's marketed by bethel farms um, it is making a huge impact across the state of Florida and uh, for two reasons. For one, it grows at about half the rate of Floritam. And so we've been doing a lot of research with this. And so there's actually a, a, a gene in the plant that keeps that plant compact. Um, and so it takes it, it requires about 50 percent less mowing um, compared to, to your standard cultivars. The other side is that it has um, glyphosate tolerance in the uh, plant. And so you can spray right over the top of Pro Vista with glyphosate, kill the existing weeds that are there, and it will not damage the, the uh, Pro Vista St. Augustine grass. And so um, interesting uh, grass, again, 50, 60 percent less mowing because it just stays compact. Um, and you have the ability now to control weeds using a non-selective herbicide um, in that. And so that is called Pro Vista St. Augustine. The other uh, new grass, new St. Augustine, is called Citra Blue. Um, it was developed at our research center south of Gainesville in Citra. And then the color of this grass is rarely unique, and, and it, gets, it has this blue pigmentation to it, thus the name Citra Blue. And so um, it is quite noticeable. And so you can see Floritam, and then you can see the Citra Blue uh, up against uh, Floritam. It just has a unique blue-green color to it. Um, we've done quite a bit of work with this um, in, in uh, a, lot, a lot of research. It's out in, in landscapes now. It is much more drought tolerant. It appears to be much less uh, disease susceptible than other grasses. And so, but it does have some unique management practices. It tends to get thatchy. Uh, and so over time, if you have a lot of, uh, or too many inputs on this thing, especially nitrogen, this thing can get real puffy on you. And so we wanna be cautious that we don't do that. Um, and then we come to the, to the zoysia grasses. And the zoysia grasses have really made an impact in the state of Florida. Zoysias are beautiful grasses. Um, so here is a, is a lawn that uh, this happens to be empire zoysia grass. And so if we were to go down to, to central Florida to the villages, um, that is really where zoysia grass kind of made its big splash. And so zoysias have been around really forever, um, but they're much, much more um, prevalent in, in the state of Florida. But what we've learned from zoysia grasses in the state of Florida, unfortunately, has come at a fairly high price. Um, a lot of folks were managing zoysia grass in the same manner that they were managing their St. Augustine grass, because a lot of times these lawns were literally next to each other. Um, and then what happened is kind of the train wreck started to occur. Um, and so a team of myself and some of my colleagues, we started doing these zoysia grass workshops, full day of, of uh, of evidence-based uh, education on how to best manage zoysia grass in the, in the Florida landscape. 
And so we look at the, the zoysias and there are really three, more or less three different species that, that, that uh, are, are grown in the landscapes in Florida. And, and they're really separated kind of by their leaf texture. And so the ones that you're probably most familiar with, your empire zoysia, for example, is a japonica. And so it's more of this coarse uh, leaf textured and coarse is a relative term, much finer than St. Augustine. But, um, and then you have the matrellas and the pacificas um, that have much, much finer leaf blades. Um, so the japonicas and the matrellas, and sometimes there's some hybridization between these are what we see really in the, in the landscape now. And so when we think about the japonicas, uh, El Toro, and there's really only one grower in the state of Florida, I believe, that is growing El Toro, and that's up in the panhandle. Um, Jammer, that's a, a, a grass that was, uh, its namesake was from a, a USDA scientist by the name of Jack Murray. And uh, he and uh, Texas A&M uh, retired researcher traveled all over um, uh, origins, areas of origin of zoysia grass and did a lot of collections. And so they brought their grasses back to the, to the U.S. and started doing a lot of development. And so the scientist from Texas A&M, he took half of them and, the, and Jack Murray with USDA took half of them um, and went and started, you know, evaluating them. And, and, uh, and Jack passed away and, and his collection of zoysia grasses moved through the family and then ultimately to, uh, to Blade Runner Farms out in Texas, where they continued to release some of these lines. But Jack Murray or Jammer was one of those zoysias. Palisades um, is a grass that came out of that uh, Texas A&M program. So when they traveled all over the world, Palisades was one of these japonicas that came out of, out of the Texas uh, collection. Empire comes from a proprietary company, and so Sawn Solutions brought Empire to the market. And again, Empire is the most predominant zoysia grass grown in the state of Florida. Ultimate Flora is an older one uh, that we released at the University of Florida. And then Zenith is actually a seeded variety. And so if you were to go down to your box stores, you might see zoysia grass seed, and it is likely Zenith. Um, Candidly, in research here conducted in the state of Florida, it has not performed as well, but it is one of the few seeded varieties that is out there. And then there's a, another variety that is downstate uh, called Icon Zoysia, which is making, uh, um, it's readily available in the market. But these, all of these are kind of um, known for their coarser leaf texture. Again, that's a relative term. Uh, much dense, uh, less dense and less thatched than these Matrella species. And I'll show you some of those in a second, but relatively good shade tolerance. And we'll talk about that relativity again here in a second, relatively good drought tolerance. And again, I'm gonna unpack that. Um, these have a pretty good rate of establishment. Um, and then they all have large patch concerns. And so that's that, that disease that we said impacts St. Augustine. It is a serious disease in zoysia grass. All of these need to be mowed at two inches or lower. And that's the problem where we're seeing these real problems with zoysia grass. It was because the mowing heights uh, were, were getting up above two inches. Um, the matrellas, as you can see from this image, are much finer textured. So Zeon, that's one that came out of that Blade Runner group. Tacoa Green or Christine Flora, this was the University of Florida release. Geo is being marketed by Sod Solutions and then a couple others that are there. This one over here, Diamond Zoysia Grass, is used on some really high-end landscapes. Um, over on the East Coast, you'll see some of this. This one can be maintained at a quarter of an inch in height. And so these are very fine uh, to fine leaf textures, very dense, and generally these have quite good shade tolerance um, as well. They tend to be, in some cases, less drought tolerant, um, and they tend to have better color in the winter months than, say, the japonica lines. Again, large patch disease um, is, is a problem, and these really need to be mowed at a height of cut of a half an inch, maybe upwards to an inch and a half. Um, and so when we look at these, uh, just some pictures. Here's El Toro. This is the japonica. Um, we look at empire again. I mean, you see these, uh, you know, the zoysia grass in the landscape when properly managed, they're just beautiful. Um, we look at jammer. Um, 
and again, so it's going to have again that that Empire Jammer. Those looks are going to be very similar. A little variation in color um, as well. Here's some Icon. Looks to be a little bit darker in its coloration. Again, these are those coarser textured zoysia grasses. Um, Palisades. Again, this is one that came out of Texas. It is much more common. Um, more recently in the state that for, for many years, uh, this grass wasn't available in Florida and then was recently, in the last couple of years, was licensed by a grower here in Florida. So, um, and then we look at the finer textures and these tend to be used more in the golf environment. In fact, Xeon was the, the grass that was on the Olympic golf course in Rio de Janeiro uh, on the fairways. Uh, you can see it growing here in some shaded environment. Um, as well as in a full sun environment. Um, a little bit, maybe a lot more um, difficult to manage um, or, or at least more precision is required in managing some of these finer textured ones. This is Xeon in the foreground. And so this shows you this large patch. Again, this is a major issue of zoysia grass. And it is, if you are in a high end landscape and this is not desirable to you, again, that 65 to 75 degree temperature, both in the spring and the fall, are where we need to be focused uh, for prevention of this disease. Now, um, Citrozoi, uh, this is a, a new one that has been released by the University of Florida. Um, and so again, the name Citra, just like with our Citra Blue, but this is Citrozoi, Citrozoysia grass. Um, and it was researched under the designation 1307. And uh, you can see here in this landscape, it's a beautiful grass. And uh, interestingly, this grass appears to have some pretty good uh, large patch uh, non-preference, resistance, less susceptibility. And so we had some strips of, uh, uh, Breeder had some strips of this grass over in, uh, in uh, on a farm uh, south of, of Jacksonville where they had strips of all of the different lines of, of zoysia grass that were in the breeding program and 1307 from one end of the field to the other had no no rhizoctonia no large patch on it the grasses on both sides of 1307 had large patch um, on the uh, on this on the turf and so 1307 is, is looking real promising um, and it has just recently been released by the University of Florida. These are all vegetatively propagated, meaning you have to plug them in or sod them in. And so it takes a while from when they're released to when there's sufficient acreage in the marketplace to be able to meet the demand. So stay tuned on this one. It, it's, it's coming down the line and we're pretty excited about it um, as well. Well, the zoysias also get some of the uh, pest moths that, uh, and in particular, the sod webworm and the fall armyworm that uh, can impact the zoysia. And so you'll see these moths uh, fly around in the summertime. The tropical sod webworm moth tends to fly kind of in a zigzag pattern. Um, and as that moth is flying along in that zigzag pattern, uh, she's laying eggs. And those eggs will hatch and form these, uh, the worms or the caterpillars. Interestingly, the, the damage on zoysia grass is a bit different than what we would see on St. Augustine grass. Uh, the damage on the zoysia grass tends to be more of just kind of a, a scraping or a mining of the green foliage, uh, the green leaf. And so if you look, the leaf blades are still intact, but the green of the plant, kind of the, the outside layer of cells are scraped off by this uh, this, this worm, and then the worm just kind of walks across the top of the leaf blades and, and, uh, and causes the, the injury. It can be really problematic or it can just be cosmetic. It just kind of depends on the level of infestation and that then is gonna warrant whether it needs to be uh, treated or not. I tend to be more of a curative kind of guy. Um, you know, you know, monitor that problem over time, and if it gets it out, if it gets outside of control or gets out of control, then 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 pull the trigger on control. But but going out there and just kind of you know preventatively trying to you know keep these problems at bay maybe is not the the best approach. Um, maybe with the exception of that large patch, large patch can be quite problematic for us. Bill bugs are an interesting little white grub that can impact zoysia grass from time to time. The hunting bill bug, 
um, gets its name. This is the adult, and it's got this, it's a little snout beetle. And, uh, but this is the joker that's causing the problem. And this is a little tiny larva, not the big old white grubs, you know, that the, that the armadillos and the possums are digging up in your lawn. These are little bitty tiny. In fact, this little billbug larvae bores into the stem of the zoysia grass. And so they're much smaller. They do not have legs. Um, and so they're legless larvae, but this is the adult um, that, that gives rise to this uh, billbug larva. Um, and the damage is, it's, it, it's very different than say, you know, what the old white grub uh, type damage. This one here tends to, because that, that insect is getting into that stem, the stem, it almost you know, will look like a kind of a drought injury initially um, in time. Well, let's talk about drought because zoysia grasses are marketed as being very drought tolerant grasses. And that is a very technically true statement. Um, and but what happens with zoysia grass is it says I'm going to avoid the drought by going dormant. Whereas St. Augustine grass or the other grasses in time, they kind of, you know, when water is withheld, they, they tend to, you know, they start out green and then they kind of slowly fade yellow. And then, you know, in severe drought maybe turns brown in a, in a level of dormancy. Well, zoysia grass can do that very, very quickly. It's just a mechanism within the species. And so they're very drought tolerant, but the problem is, is most consumers, their definition of drought tolerance is that it stays green with no water. And here's an example. There's a sprinkler head right here that is not functioning properly. And so what happened over time is this site, this spot did not get, get irrigation. And so it heads into dormancy very, very quickly. And in fact, we look at this and I did a zoysia grass drought response, a little demo some years ago. So two days, no water, four days, we're starting to see some leaf rolling, six days, more leaf rolling. By nine days, we're starting to wilt. And then by 12 days and 15 days, this thing has, has completely wilted. Now, that grass has rhizomes and stolen. So a lot of stem tissue um, that is there full of carbohydrates. And when water returns or rain returns, this thing will pop back green uh, very quickly. And so it, it handles drought, it just does it differently. Um, and so when we look across the grasses, Bahia grass has excellent drought tolerance. In other words, it maintains green color under drought conditions, but it can wilt and it will go dormant. Think about all the highways and byways in the state of Florida. Bahia grass is the predominant grass up and down our highways, never irrigated other than, than rain fed. Bermuda grasses have pretty excellent drought tolerance too, but they will turn bluish gray under reduced water and they eventually turn brown. Centipede has pretty good drought tolerance. It persists on less water, but can wilt quickly um, in the absence of water. And it's interesting in a non-irrigated centipede grass, early in the morning when the dew is there, that grass will be nice and green. But as soon as that dew dries off and, uh, and the sun comes up, that grass will wilt uh, very quickly. St. Augustine grass, relatively good drought tolerance. It wilts, but some leaves will remain green for a longer period of time. And then zoysia grasses, actually, we define them as having excellent drought tolerance, but they wilt quickly in the absence of water. And within one or two weeks, they're brown. And they will go completely dormant in the absence of water. Now, let's talk about water. So in the state of Florida, we get anywhere from 48 to 65 inches of rain. And so we get a tremendous amount of rain in the state of Florida. But all of this over here on this map, all this yellow, these soils are the flatwood soils. But if you look at all the soil types in Florida, by and large, were sandy. And sandy soils have low water holding capacity. So even though we get a lot of rain, we have sandy soils with low water holding capacity. And so what happens in time is we get these periodic droughts as opposed to long-term droughts that you see out in, in, the, uh, in the West. And so this is a big study I did. I have a facility called the Linear Gradient irrigation facility where I can test cultivars of grass. And so the, the system is designed to provide uh, more than the plant needs down the center line. And then, so it has 120% of what the plant needs at the center line. And then as you go to the outside edges, it is zero. And so you see from this thermal image in the down the line, you can see relative drought tolerance of these grasses. Um, 
uh, based on these. And then you can see some of these strips here where we're actually testing the, the relationship between fertilizer use as well as, as irrigation. And so you can see what happens in these, these red strips here where there was no fertilizer applied under these drought conditions. When we look at rainfall versus evapotranspiration, and I have this data for all over Florida, but this one happens to just focus on the Florida Panhandle. When we look at our rain, and that's the blue bars, and we look at evapotranspiration. So that's the water that's lost from the soil and water that moves through the plant when we add them all up together. And so we see anywhere that the blue bar is taller than the orange bar, theoretically, we shouldn't be running our sprinkler system because we're getting enough water to meet the evaporative demands of that turf grass. And so if we look in the Florida Panhandle for this particular year, April, uh, March, April, May, and then maybe over here in October, where those, those were the only months that where ET, so what the water that was being you know, moved through the plant, through the soil, exceeded rainfall. And then you see months like September and August where really our sprinklers probably should never be running. Now, the reality is, is that our rains tend to come kind of feast or famine. Um, and so, you know, if you got a big rain on Monday and then nothing for the next six days, uh, you could find where the irrigation would be needed in a supplemental capacity. And so we look this panhandle, we had 51 inches of rain at this particular site and the plant over that whole year only used 39 inches. So theoretically, we were providing enough rain to meet the demands of the grass. But again, there are dry seasons and there are wet seasons. And so we do a lot of work testing these, these functions. So we come back to our zoysia grass. And irrigation is absolutely essential. Uh, or irrigation uniformity is absolutely essential. Now, zoysia grass is the grass that will tattle on you if your irrigation system is not um, uniform. All the other grasses will respond. We just don't see them quite as dramatic as this. And the only way to be able to test uniformity of an irrigation system is by doing a catch can test. So this is the same landscape. What happened here is when the sprinklers were put in, these shrubs were much, much smaller or they maybe weren't even there. But in time, our shrubbery uh, increases in size. And so now these irrigation heads are, uh, the, the coverage of these sites is not uniform. And then when you mix in that our sandy soils and we can see where these problems really start to, to show themselves. Now, catch can test. You can use these fancy catch cans or you can use straight sided cans like cat food cans or, or tuna fish cans. And you put them out there and you run the sprinklers to see how much water was in each of those. And so you set your watch and you say, okay, I'm going to run. I want to get a half an inch of water in the can. How long did that take? Um, and that is actually what, however long it took, let's say it took 37 minutes for the first zone and it took 43 minutes for the second zone and 54 minutes for the third zone. Those are the numbers that should go in the irrigation controller, not 60 minutes, 60 minutes, 60 minutes. It's whatever it took to get a half an inch of water in the can. That is what your irrigation controller should be set at. Now, secondarily, if when you start looking at these catch cans, if this can has an inch, and this can has a quarter inch, and this can has a half an inch, our uniformity in distribution is way out of whack. And so, and that happens in time. So, you know, person mowing the lawn, mowed over the top of the sprinkler head, they went to the truck, they dug through the toolbox and they found a new nozzle or a new sprinkler head. And they said, the head I broke is black, the head I have is black, and they threw it in. But they never looked at the nozzles, they never looked at flow rates or anything. Maybe they didn't quite adjust it right. Uh, and so this catch can test should be done really annually to tune up that irrigation system to make sure that it is delivering water uniformly. We've done a lot of work on drought. And so these are 30 days of drought and you can see our research plots, but you can see these little white things sticking up. Um, and that is actually these, these white tubes. These were two PhD students that uh, worked for me and, and Dr. Kenworthy, our turf breeder. And this gizmo that is stuck down in that tube is a very, very expensive camera system that takes pictures of the root system. And so we actually have studied the, the root development of all of the different grasses. And you can see this is what the images look like. And so this is a, uh, a Zoysia matrella, uh, BA336. So this was an experimental line that we were working with versus Xeon, which was the industry standard. Now look at the root system here versus the root system here. 
the experimental line had tremendous more, more roots than, than the industry standard. And so these are the kinds of things we look for when we're developing new grasses. Um, well, let's talk about shade tolerance a little bit because people love their trees, but they want grass as well. And those two things don't generally go together. So Bahia grass, Bermuda grass, pretty poor uh, shade tolerance. Centipede grass, eh, fair maybe. St. Augustine grass, we would consider it good and the zoysias we would consider good. But let's look at these numbers. And so this was Dr. Brian Glenn. He did his PhD under my direction working in the lab. Well, we uh, tested a number of things. And so you can buy these little gizmos here. I call them the turkey thermometers for measuring light. Um, you buy a three pack, they're about 55, 56 bucks a piece. Put one in full sun, one in, in the shaded environment, one halfway in between. And then you can determine, well, how much light do you actually have in there? Um, and quantify it. And so we have determined the, the minimum thresholds that these various grasses need. We used to say, well, this grass needed six hours or this grass needed eight hours of light. Well, this is a better way of quantifying light. We call it DLI, daily light integral. And that is, you know, that's that's the way the plant sees light because in the morning the sun comes up that plant sees a little bit of light heat of the afternoon that sun's directly overhead that plant is receiving a lot of light at that point and as the sun goes down it receives less light but we can see some of these so we've talked about this you know hybrid bermuda grass tiffway that's what's on a lot of golf courses it required the most light then i mentioned that tiff grand and celebration as being shade tolerant bermudas well, they require about 10, 15 percent less light. And so they're relatively more shade tolerant than the industry standard. But go down here to the zoysia grasses on the bottom of the list. They require half the amount of light that the Bermuda grasses do. So we have these numbers now. And so we can go in if we quantify how much light is in that environment where we're going to put the turf. We can pick and choose which grasses tend to do better in that light environment. Well, as we kind of think about bringing this uh, to an end, what do these pictures have in common? Of course, we've got a big old steak and a baked potato. Uh, for those that are holding off on the red meat, we have a salad. And then, of course, we have some dog food there for, for Bowser. And what do these pictures have in common with this picture? Well, they're food. And so you and I need food to survive. Bowser needs some food to survive. But plants need food to survive as well. And that food is, is elements or, or nutrients. And so fertilizer in the state of Florida is, uh, you know, causes a lot of concern for water quality. Um, and, and so we look at that and, and I, we have these fertilization guidelines for uh, the three regions of Florida based on those grasses that we've talked about, Bahia, Bermuda, Centipede, St. Augustine, and Zoysia. So if you're in North Florida, and that's kind of that line from, you know, kind of a Ocala North, um, that's where you are at. If you're in Central Florida, so that line from Ocala down to about State Road 70, you are what we would consider in Central Florida. And then south of that State Road 70, you're in South Florida. And so again, based on what grass you have and where you live in the state, we have these numbers. Well, how do we do that? And so we, we, we generate these kind of growth potential models. And so we know up here in the dead of winter, we're not growing a whole lot of grass, um, you know, in January, February, November, December. Um, you go down to Key West, that's this top line. Even in, in January, we're about 40% growth potential, but these are warm season grasses and they grow well in the warm season and then they taper off in the fall. Um, and so this is the period of time where these grasses are growing most. And we actually can do the math to determine in North Florida and Central Florida and in South Florida how much nutrient those plants can assimilate, uh, how much fertilizer can be, be put on the ground. And the reality is, is that when the grasses are growing like a banshee in the heat of the summer, you can throw a tremendous amount of, of nutrient at these uh, turf grasses and they will assimilate it um, as well. And so we have these fertilizer ordinances. I think we're at about 108, 109 fertilizer ordinances in the state of Florida. And many of them do not allow fertilizer to be applied in the warm season, which is when that plant is actually assimilating those applied nutrients. And I like to ask this question. You know, football players, research tells us football players need about 50 calories per 2.2 pounds during the season. So when they're playing football in the fall, a 300 pound lineman will eat 6,800 calories a day. 
on average based on the research. That's what they need. And that's because they're doing two a days, they're practicing, they've got games on you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Thursday, whatever. Um, well, what happens when this lineman eats this many calories in the off season? Well, the reality is, is they become fat and they become sluggish. And so a lot of these fertilizer ordinances allow fertilizer in the off season. And I have great concern about that because that is the, where the potential for impairment increases not in the middle of the summer. In the middle of the summer, they're all basing it, uh, the, the advocates of the, of, the, of the fertilizer restrictions are saying, well, it's in the rainy season in Florida. And that is pretty inconsistent with what the research supports. Um, this is the most non-scientific evidence that I can show you that fertilizers don't really run off. Um, this was a drop spreader fertilizer and you got some slope here. If fertilizer ran off, you would see these, these lines would not be nearly as distinct. Um, and so let me quickly speak about winter risers because we have a lot of folks that are from up north that come to Florida to retire or to live in the winter months. Winter risers are a good thing up north. They are not a good thing down south. And winter risers are defined as having nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but that first number is high. So 25%, 18%, 10%. 24%. Winterizers in the north are not a bad thing. Remember, we have this warm season growth curve. And in the winter months, that grass is trying to go to bed for the winter, or at least that growth is slowing down. We don't want to stimulate that grass growth in the fall of the year. Now, cool season grasses have a dual growth inflection. And so this is why this, this growth inflection right here is why winterizers are an okay thing on cool season grasses, because those cool season grasses will resume growth in the fall. And so what about weed and feed products? It kind of depends. Um, sometimes you'll see like a 008 with a, fertilizer, uh, with, a, with a herbicide on there. This by definition is a weed and feed because it's on a fertilizer. But there's no nitrogen here, and that's just a little bit of potassium. But a product like this, it has 15015 with the weed killer in it. I'm not an advocate because a lot of times, especially in North Florida, uh, the time to feed and the time to kill the weeds, they're, they're not consistent. So like for crabgrass, which are these types of products, crabgrass is going to germinate up around March 1st, but we don't want to fertilize fertilizer until about mid-April. And so the plant gets kind of confused. So I'm not a big advocate of these things. What about liquid versus granules? We get a lot of comments, you know, liquid fertilizer, granular fertilizer, which is best? Well, if you do a real close lookup of, of a turf grass, this is St. Augustine grass, one thing you will not find are these teeth. All fertilizers that the plant is going to assimilate liquid nutrients. If you put it on the ground as a granule, it has to dissolve into the soil solution, and then the roots will assimilate that nutrient into the leaves. If you put a liquid, if the, if the spray company puts a liquid fertilizer out there, well, candidly, most of them took a granule and dissolved it in the tank before they ever showed up at your house. And they're going to spray a liquid, and so they've just skipped a step in that process. I mean, they're putting, you know, the granule is not going to dissolve. There's another side of that, too. Now, a lot of our granule products are slow release, but there are liquid slow release fertilizers as well. So liquid versus granular, some say that one is better environmentally than the other. There's not a lot of evidence to support that. And here's the deal. This massive fibrous root system of the turf grass assimilates a lot of nutrients. Um, and it's this thing here, you know, grasses are the best known biofilters to man. You know, if you don't believe me from a turf person, just, just look it up. We use grasses in mine reclamation sites to, you know, to get the uh, old metals and stuff out of, the, out of the ground. And so new sod, however, lacks those fibrous root system and nutrients can leach. And so that's why we suggest never applying fertilizer to newly sodded lawns for at least 30 to 60 days and never put a pre-plant fertilizer on the ground with the little exception of phosphorus and if you've had a soil test but I don't want any nitrogen on the ground for the first 30 to 60 days. Why? Because there's no root system. And what do we do when we put sod on the ground? We tend to irrigate. And so that water can push those nutrients down below and into the water um, as a result. 
Well, let's wrap up and talk about mowing height because this is probably the most important cultural practice and it influences everything. And so the, the, the proper mowing height is going to maximize that root structure out there. And what happens is we start mowing too tall or we don't mow frequently enough. So in a shaded environment like over here, this grass gets real spindly and that growing point tends to elevate and we come and we lop it off um, and we can have some real problems. So and you can see that. So this is Bermuda grass at one and a half inches in a, in a shaded environment over here, full sun over here versus a half inch height of cut, full sun on your left, um, almost full shade on the right, you can see what happens is the grasses need to be uh, higher cut in that shaded environment. So optimal mowing practices, Bahia grasses need higher heights of cut. Bermuda grasses tend to be better at the lower, you know, one or two inches in the landscape. Centipede grass, really two inches or below would be ideal. St. Augustine's, we've historically said two to four inches, depending which grasses you're growing. Some of the dwarf or semi-dwarf varieties can handle that lower height of cut. And then those zoysia grasses need to be at less than two inches. Um, and if you're growing those matrellas, even shorter than that. Well, robotic mowers, that's been an area we've looked at the last couple of years. And so I want to show you, so these darker green plots, that's actually grass that's mowed once a week with just a conventional lawnmower. This is Floratam St. Augustine grass. And then these are Honda Mimos. Um, so this is the Honda uh, mower. And at the time, this mower could not mow uh, greater than about two inches of height of cut. Um, and so the question we were you know, tasked with, you know, could you use a Honda Mimo where it goes out and mows this plot every single day, just like your, like your vacuum cleaner, couldn't you maintain Floratam St. Augustine at this 2.4 inch height of cut versus a conventional? And the answer from the data is absolutely. Um, if you look at this little red line here, this is the Mimo and the blue line is the walk mower. So overall turf quality was actually a little bit better when that grass was mowed every single day of the week. What about the cover and the quality of the cover? Notice here that that robotic mower actually had a better quality cut. Um, even at that lower height of cut, even on Floratam. And the reason for that is because it goes out and mows a little bit every day. In fact, you never see grass clippings because that thing is, is going out there and it's just nicking the tops of those blades every single day of the week um, as well. And so we have covered a lot of ground in a 60 minute time period. Um, and so I put this up there, you know, follow us on, on uh, on Twitter, we put a lot of our research pictures and, and, and findings up there as well. And so we started by looking at the grasses, kind of the pros and the cons of those various grasses. Uh, and then I hit the highlights of, of those things from fertilizer, you know, making sure we're using the right rate at the right time of year. We looked at irrigation, the fact that you've got to have some uniformity there. Um, and, and that really needs to be tested annually to make sure that, uh, that, that that sprinkler heads are doing what they're supposed to be doing um, as well. So, all right, I see a question here. I don't know, Jennifer, if you want to moderate, but sure. what's a good, good salt water tolerant grass? And how about grasses for folks with dogs? Those are two good questions. So we used to have a grass, well, we have a grass in golf, in golf environment called seashore pass um, And you can irrigate it with a tremendous amount of salt water. The problem is, is it never really did very well in the urban landscape because it had some pretty uh, different management requirements and most people couldn't, couldn't provide what it needed. Not that it was hard, it just was different. Um, but all of our grasses, surprisingly St. Augustine grass is one of the more salt tolerant grasses. And so um, it just, you know, if you're running some of those salts, um, having the ability to, to periodically, especially in the dry season, to leach those salts out of the environment. Um, and then about grasses with folks with dogs, I'll tell you that the zoysia grasses, interestingly, are very salt tolerant grasses, but boy, they don't like dog urine at all. Um, and they tend to burn um, in those spots. And then the, the urea that's in the, in, the, in the dog urine, actually those brown spots come back with a with full vigor and, and now then you have green spots that grow too tall. Um, there really is no good grass for, for dogs. It, it is more of a, 
well, how many dogs, how big of an area are they doing their thing? Um, are you picking that, that manure up or the dog urine? You can't pick it up. Um, but you know, are you dispersing it in time? That, that's the question. No real good grass. Well, great. We are, um, looks like that's the only question. Um, when we're just on time. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask is when do you think citrozoi will be available um, more readily? So, you know, when we, when we develop our grass, we start with a single sprig and then, um, and then we move to little plots, you know, then five foot by five foot plots. And then ultimately, you know, we may put a quarter acre in on a sod farm and then we have to, you know, most sod growers, I mean, they don't want to sell it yet because they want to expand it on the farm. Um, so I would suggest it takes a couple years for okay. that ramp up to occur. Um, and so it's even difficult, you know, I need the grass for research plots, but trying to, you know, it's, it's a balance, but so I think you're a couple years out. I mean, okay. and we were in the same boat two years ago with Citra Blue mm -hmm. um, and it's now becoming more available. So. Okay. I, we have one more question. Foot traffic, many yards, especially newer homes have narrow yards, which put a lot of repeat foot traffic over the same areas of turf again and again. Any good recommendations besides replace with paths? Not, not, not really. Um, it's, um, and especially a lot of times, you know, that foot trap, that, that narrow path is between the houses and in between the houses, then you have structure shade that, you know, so that the plants simply mm -hmm. aren't getting enough light there. And that goes back to principle number one of, of you know, FYE and right plant, right place. And mm -hmm. reality, you can't, uh, turf grass in that scenario is not a right plant in the right place. Um, these plants, even and I showed you that shade tolerance, that, mm -hmm. that data, um, it still has to have light. You know, photosynthesis is driven by the sun. Um, and so there's a question on the graph of ET versus rainfall. Would you be able to share? Yeah, um, I can do that. I can, I, I've got them for all, all over the state. I will point to if you, you know, if you're just kind of interested in this whole ET versus rain th uh, thing, the University of Florida, we have the FAWN weather system. And so Florida Ag Weather Network or Automated Weather Network. And so if you Google FAWN, F-A-W-N, um, you will see these weather stations. There's about 30 of them all over the state of Florida. And you can go back and, and it, they take data every 15 minutes. And then you can go back 25 years. Um, and you can see that rainfall in, in ET. Now the ET is going to come in um, on, a, on a moment by moment. You need to you know, sum them up and multiply by the number of you know, days in a month. But, but you can see the rainfall versus ET you know, real time by going to Fawn, the Fawn Weather Network. It's a really cool tool. It was developed for citru citrus monitoring for frost protection and whatnot. But again, those, those towers are all over the state of Florida, um, taking data every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Great. Um, if you all stick around, there'll be a survey at the end of this presentation. Um, it helps me uh, schedule interesting and new topics for you all for this uh, homeowner webinar series. So again, thank you, Dr. Unruh. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, and everybody have a good day.